study, I wrote this study on Matthew 24. So if anybody, I'm not going I can't go into that much depth here tonight because it would take me forever. But I'm going to hit some highlights. And if anybody wants to know more and study for yourself, you can, um, you let me know. We'll get more of these printed because they're all, they've all sold out. But I have one copy here and we can get more made if you want one. Okay? Anyway, so. <laughs> but what was it? Week before last, I started on Matthew 24. Okay, I'm just going to, I already taught the first part of Matthew 24, so I'm going to do the second part, and I'm just going to do some review. Um, we know that Jesus came, he lived, he demonstrated his kingdom for three and a half years. He dies, he establishes the new covenant in his blood. But the new covenant was not completely removed. I mean the old covenant, I'm sorry, was not completely removed. The new covenant came, it made the old covenant invalid. Hebrews 8.13 says this, that the new covenant has made the old covenant obsolete and outdated. What is obsolete is soon to fade away. So after the cross, the writer of Hebrews says that the new covenant established at the cross made the old covenant invalid. Is everybody following that okay? Well, what did it make invalid? Jesus said, it is finished, teleos. And there's a lot of stuff that I could go into there. But he came and he fulfilled the old covenant, right? And he established the new covenant in his blood. What was made invalid? The natural priesthood, the natural stone temple, the natural priestly sacrifices, the five priestly sacrifices of the Old Covenant. There's new ones in the New Covenant. But all those things, the animal sacrifices, the rituals they went through, they were made invalid by the New Covenant established in Jesus' blood. Amen. So after the cross, the Old Covenant is now invalid. But the Old Covenant continued all the way up until the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. For 40 years, the, from the cross until the temple being destroyed, there is a crossover period where the Old Covenant and the New Covenant are together. They're, they're coexisting. Wow. Jesus establishes the new covenant in his blood at the cross, but the new covenant is not fully inaugurated until the old is completely removed. Okay? You cannot have a new covenant without transitioning out of the old covenant. The shift that took place in the first century was not about the destruction of planet Earth, but the removal of the old and the fully entering into the new. Okay, go to Matthew 24. That was just a little introduction. Matthew 24. And I want to read verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading out of the Amplified, so yours, yours may read a little bit different. I'm going to try to go line upon line and not get ahead of myself, which is difficult. <laughs> Jesus departed from the temple area and was going on his way when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings of the temple and point them out to him. But he answered them, Do you see all these? Truly I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another, that will not be thrown down. While he was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, 
when will this take place and what will be the sign of your coming and at, of the end or completion, the consummation, the Amplified says, of the consummation of the age. And you, last time Lisa said, yours said world. King James says world. Does somebody have a translation that says world or does yours say age? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go through this. Tell us, when will this take place? When is the, when's the temple going to be destroyed? And what's the sign of your coming? And of the end or completion of the age. The age that they knew when the temple was destroyed, what would happen? The old, that whole system was gone. They knew that probably the city would be destroyed that whole old covenant economy was that mosaic age. And they were asking him, when we know that when the temple's destroyed, it's going to be over with. The old cup, that old covenant, because that's where they went and made all their sacrifices. That's where they celebrated the feasts. That's where all their religious ceremony took place. That's all they had known. But there was a 40-year period before that happened. Okay, we'll talk more about your, his coming too. We said, and if you want, if you get my pamphlet, you'll get more about this. But when they were said, when are you coming? When will this take place? And what will be the sign of your coming? We said, they weren't talking about a second coming. They couldn't have been because they never even knew he was going to go away. They thought the Messiah was going to come and set up a kingdom in Jerusalem and rule from their temple. So they weren't asking him, when are you coming again? So what are they asking him? If you go back, you sometimes have to go back into the Old Testament in the scriptures and look and see what are they talking about. They knew the scriptures, which is Old Testament. <laughs> and so they're saying they knew everywhere where you see coming in the Old Testament, it's always a coming in judgment. Correct? It was a coming in judgment. So when are you going to come in judgment on this old, on the old covenant? That's what they're asking. Not when is the earth going to end. 70 A.D. was such a pivotal point in church history. It's when the Old Covenant, that old Mosaic age and system was totally annihilated. They had no more temple to go to. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I knew I would. <laughs> Whoa. Anyway, Jesus points it out and says, Do you not see these things? Traits? Truly I say to you, there shall not be one stone left upon another which shall not be thrown down. And probably they were alarmed, maybe even traumatized at this, because they knew what it meant. The disciples also remember the woes that Jesus had pronounced upon the Jewish unbelievers immediately preceding the Olivet Discourse. Go to Matthew 23. And there were no verse and chapter that that was put in there. But this, it's all, you have to take everything in context. A text out of context is pretext. So let's go to ch chapter 23 and go to verses. I'm not going to read all of them. We did some of that last time. But in Matthew 23, Jesus unleashes on the Pharisees. Woe, 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 after woe he is pronouncing on them. Go to, um, anyway, let's see, let's go up to verse 35. So that upon your heads may come all the blood of the righteous shed on earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. 
Truly I declare to you, all these evil, calamitous times will come upon this generation. And I want you, I told you before, underline generation. He said, all these woes are going to come upon this generation. And then verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, murdering the prophets and stoning those who were sent to you, how often I would have gathered your children together as a mother gathers her brood under her wings and you refused. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. Whoa. He said, your house is left to you desolate. Your house is going to be left. What was their house? It was that whole old mosaic economy. It's going to be wiped out. It's going to be left, to, left desolate. This statement made by Jesus was his prophecy of the coming judgment that would be poured out upon them in 70 AD. The utter destruction of both the city and the temple. I was a Christian for many years before I ever heard anything about 70 AD. I didn't have the foggiest what had happened. And here, Jesus gives them a time frame of when these things are going to take place. We just read it in Matthew 23, 36. He says, truly, I declare to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And there's another, we've got to understand, what is gen a generation? What does it mean? He gives them a time frame. And then in Matthew 24, 34, near the end of the Olivet Discourse, he says this. Let me get it here. Truly I tell you, this generation, and I'm reading this out of the Amplified, the whole multitude of people living at the same time in a definite given, given period will not pass away till all these things taken together take place. Or this generation that I'm speaking to will not pass away until these things that I'm predicting here take place. The Greek word here for generation is J-E-N-E-A and means generation. It means a multitude of contemporaries. The average duration of a human life. It was usually about 40 years. So that's what, if you look up that word, and I got a whole bunch on it in what I wrote there. Of all the 38 appearances of the word G-E-N-E-A, all have the meaning of contemporaries. <laughs> Without any shadow of doubt, the expression, this generation, always refers solely and exclusively to his contemporaries, the Jewish people of his own period. So he put a time frame on Matthew 24, the longest prophecy Jesus gave. And he's speaking in its audience relevance. He's speaking to them. And he's saying, this is going to happen in your generation. And it did. It's history. It's not a future event. Look at verse 3, and we kind of looked at this. In verse 3, Matthew 24, they say, tell us when will this take place? Well, he puts a time frame on it. And what will be the sign of your coming? And I believe it's your coming in judgment on the Old Covenant. And of the end of the consummation of the Jewish age, the Mosaic economy. Verses 4 through 14, they ask us, what are the signs of your coming? How, how are we going to know? And he begins to give them some signs to look for. The first one is Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5. Be careful that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah. 
and will lead many astray. So that's one of the things they needed to look for. Did that happen in 70 AD? Have you guys studied this? Have you looked into it? Did that happen in 70 AD? Yes, it did. There were appearances of false Christs. The Jewish expectation was that their Messiah would come, deliver them from Roman bondage, and set up an earthly kingdom ruling from the temple in Jerusalem. This is the reason many of them rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It became easy for them to believe the Messiah was still to come, so false messiahs came. And I'm going to this is a quote from a historian. From the death of Herod the Great to the destruction of the temple, the Jewish history is filled with names of false Christs who deceived both Jews and Samaritans. None appeared before this period and not for five or six centuries after this period. And that's from a man named K-E-T-T. -T. It's history. It's written history. 1 John 2.18, children, it is the last hour, the end of the age. <laughs> and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have risen, which confirms our belief that it is the final time, the end time. We don't need to be looking for the Antichrist. We do not need to be looking for the Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? Man, it's been so many down through history and make your head spin. The Antichrist, that spirit was already there. There were many false Christs that came. Many said they were the Messiah. That's, that's written in history. Whoa. When John said this, he was referring to the approaching end of the age, the Mosaic Old Economy, and of the prophecies of Christ relating to the false prophets who were to appear at the end of the age. Jesus had warned his disciples that these men would be showing up, and they did. The next thing that he warns them to look for, have you ever heard, man, there's wars and rumors of wars the end of the world. Earthquakes, famines, floods. <laughs> but these things that Jesus prophesied happened in that 40-year period. Matthew 24, 6, he told them, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened or troubled, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. The end of what? The end of the old Jewish economy. I, I just, some of this stuff just upsets me. <laughs> the next thing, well, we'll go more into the wars here for a second. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, after the crucifixion of Christ up to AD 70, there were three civil wars, more than three wars with foreign enemies, there were often wars with both characteristics at once. This is what Josephus, have you guys heard of Josephus? Josephus says in 40 AD there was a war in Mesopotamia which caused the deaths of more than 50,000. In AD 49 there was an uprising in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover that resulted in 10,000 to 20,000 deaths. And on and on he goes. There was war after war after war. It happened. It's history. We don't, well, we're not looking. I mean, there's been wars throughout history, but this happened before 70 AD. It's history. It's recorded in history. We're not looking at wars to see if the end of the world's going to happen. The next thing was natural disasters. He talks about that in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. Famines. There's going to be natural disasters and famines. In Acts 11, 27 through 29, it says this great famine covered the whole world. 
And this word world is important because it also said, and this is a big one, we're going to get into it, that look for it says that before the end, the gospel will be preached to the whole world. What's it talking about? <laughs> so here, the word for world is, I'm not even going to pronounce it, but it means the whole inhabited world, the Roman Empire. Because a famine covered that whole area. We'll go more into the world a little bit later. Earthquakes. Watch out for earthquakes. That's another sign that you need to look for. They needed to look for. I'm talking about them, not us. <laughs> According to historical accounts, earthquakes Quakes were far from rare for that generation. Many were mentioned by historians. Jo Josephus talks about them. Frequent earthquakes occurred by which many houses were thrown down. Twelve pops, populous cities of Asia fell in ruins from earthquake. Seneca writes in the year 58 AD, how often had cities of Asia fallen with a fatal shock and on and on about whole cities being taken out. So that also happened before 70 AD. In other words, these are the, the things to look for. These are the signs to look for, he tells them. It's not the end, but they're pointing, they're birth pangs, pointing to the end. He said, well, I'm not even going to talk about the of abomination of desolation. But the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem. And he said, when you see the army surround Jerusalem, flee. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> flee the city. He warned the believers to get out of there. And they went to Petra. And he said, if you're up on your housetop, don't come down. How in the heck could that be us? Who goes out? How many of you go up on your housetop? <laughs> he's talking to that generation because their houses they went up on their housetops and they were flat and they were right close to one another if you're on your housetop go then they could go right to the next house to flee out of the city so it was written to that generation <laughs> the next one is in Matthew 24 9 persecution Let's read that one. They will hand you over to suffer affliction and tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Hmm. There was another place I wanted to read, but anyway. Jesus told his disciples they would be delivered up to be afflicted and killed that they would be brought before councils. This is in, I think, Mark. I'm not even going to go there. And synagogues to be beaten. They would be delivered to prison and be brought before kings and rulers for his name's sake. When's the last time you've seen a Christian being delivered up to a synagogue or being beaten in a Jewish synagogue? It was written to those in 70 AD. Severe, oh, sorry, severe persecution against Christians actually began not long after the ascension of Christ. Stephen became the first martyr. Acts 8.1 Saul, and Saul was not only consenting to Stephen's death, he was pleased and entirely approving. On that day, it says, a great and severe persecution broke out against the church, which was in Jerusalem. And the Greek word for persecution in that scripture in Acts is the exact same word translated tribulation in Matthew 24, 21. Don't, the great tribulation already happened, guys. It already happened. It's history. Matthew 24, 21 says, 
for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be. He's talking to that generation. It began, great persecution began right after the ascension of Christ. The first martyr was Stephen. Whoa. And Philip Schaff, in History of the Christian Church, says this. A multitude of Christians were put to death in the most shocking manner. I hate to even read some of this stuff, but I will. Some were crucified, some were sewed up in the skins of wild beasts and exposed to wild dogs in the arena. The satanic tragedy reached its climax at the night in the imperial gardens. Christian men and women covered with pitcher, oil, or resin and nailed to posts of pine were lighted and burned as torches. While Nero, in his fantastical dress, figured in a horse race and displayed his art as a charioteer, only the cruel ingenuity of this imperial monster under the inspiration of the devil could invent such a terrible system. And actually, the early Christians believed he was the beast. <laughs> Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation. This was a local matter for them in Jerusalem and Judea, and not something that applies to people in our future. It is an actual historical fact that it happened in that generation, just as Jesus prophesied. Mm. And then we'll go to Matthew 24, 14. There's so much more detail in the study I wrote, but I, if I went into all of it, I'd bore you to tears. It's basically for somebody who really wants the information. Matthew 24, 14. And this good news of the kingdom of the gospel will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then come the end. He's still speaking of the same end, the end of the Mosaic economy. Well, was the gospel preached to the whole world? What did that word world mean? We have already seen that the end that Jesus was talking about was the end of the Old Covenant Age and not the end of the planet. What does it mean that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world? How could the gospel have been preached in all the world before 70 AD? How did a famine come to the whole world? Remember we read that? <laughs> Because that word world meant the inhabited earth, the Roman Empire. Okay, was the gospel preached to that whole inhabited world? And the key to understand this is fulfilled when looking into Scripture. Scripture will explain Scripture to us. Paul very plainly said that what Jesus predicted had actually come to pass in his own day. <sighs> Writing in 64 AD, Paul says in Colossians 1.23, of the gospel that you have heard and which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. That's Paul, that's not me. <laughs> Colossians 1.5 and 6, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world. So Paul believed it had been preached. So that had to happen before 70 AD, and it did. I mean, how many times have we heard all these predictions? Who's the Antichrist? Who's the beast? When's the great tribulation? And actually, it was three and a half years of horrible tribulation before 78. Three and a half, haven't you heard that before? That three and a half years, it's, it's interesting. I love stuff like this, but 
it's we have been duped we've been duped especially in the American church especially in the American church mm. anyway I already went to got ahead of myself and went to when you're on the rooftop don't come down and maybe I'll do some more later I don't want I don't like to because I know it can get boring it just can get so line up on line and but don't worry about going through the great tribulation are we gonna is I mean my goodness in other nations American Christians just have never had to experience much persecution am I right it's true. A lot of the stuff that is preached in the American church won't fly in some of the persecuted nations. Who was it? Watchman Nee that died in a prison? Terribly disappointed. Because he believed the rapture was coming and he would go through no kind of persecution. There is, if you, if you follow Christ, there is persecution. But it's not the great tribulation. That happened in 70 AD. Anyway, that's all I'm going to do on it. If you have, if you're interested in more, you can tell me, and we'll get more of those printed. Amen. <laughs>